Right, gotta give the people what they want, gotta do the lore research. Let me check on the Warhorn, let's... Is that... Good day everyone! Let me see here, your resident log reader at your service. It's very clear to me that Risk of Rain lore is what your people are here for, and not my undeniable charisma. So, in the words of Joseph Bros Tito, I'm gonna give the people what they want. I've been going around and asking Risk of Rain players if there are any aspects of the lore that confuses them, and now I'm going to try to bring some clarity to those confusions. Now let me make this crystal clear. Some questions here have solid answers, but you might not have enough information to give definitive answers on some of the other questions. Think of the frequently asked question section of this video as more of a here's what you know so far so I can bring you up to speed with the community's findings. The day we get the full picture on the lore is when I will be making much more detailed videos on all of the topics. You see, at my current pace I fear my videos will quickly become outdated and redundant if I made them now. Ok, now that we have that cleared up, let's get started on some misconceptions about the lore. In my timeline video, many were confused on why I so nonchalantly placed Risk of Rain 2 after Risk of Rain 1 in chronological order as some thought Risk of Rain 2 might have been a prequel of sorts, or even independent of the original timeline. Here's the evidence on why Risk of Rain 2 is a canonical sequel. The most damning is the blog post from Hope Games dev blog, where they stated that the story takes place after Risk of Rain 1. But it's pre-release talk! They could have changed it, I hear you say to yourself on the screen. Fair not, I'm not done yet. The stage in Rally Point Delta has the subtext of Contact Light Survivor Camp, Contact Light being the ship from the first game, so the survivors in the crash gathered there. Why would there be a survivor camp for a ship that crashed in the first game if the ship hadn't crashed already? We also have the gasoline log where two survivors discuss the events of the ship crashing in the past, and the tougher times log where that also shows us that there's a quote unquote rescue mission of sorts going on to the last known location of the Contact Light. All of this makes it very clear, at least to me, that Risk of Rain 2 takes place after Risk of Rain 1. I don't blame anyone for thinking this, as Hopo could have been a lot clearer on the subject. But, according to multiple developers' comments, both from the dev blog and more recent mentions from their Discord, all of them state that the characters in Risk of Rain 2 are not the same ones from Risk of Rain 1, as in that there could be multiple commando engineer suits inhabited by different people. Macrid, however, has been confirmed as the same test subject from the first game by developer Gore. Yes, that Gore. Why he was detained is for now unknown, but the current theories are that either Acrid went to the Void Realm to be left alone, based on the Risk of Rain 1 ending and Risk of Rain 2 unlock achievement, or he killed a Void Reaver and got caught in the explosion, sending him to the Void Realms. Because when you get killed by a Void Reaver's martyrdom, it says, Player has been detained. Wait your sentence at the end of time rather than that the player was killed in some other macabre way. Makes me wonder why we don't get sent to the Void Realm whenever we get caught in the Void Reaver's explosion, if that is indeed the case. Confirmed by a developer on the dev blog, not everyone of the Roar 1 survivor cast was on the Contact Light, meaning that while we could still play them, they weren't there canonically. This statement has led to two byproducts. The first one is that, quite plainly, some survivors just weren't canonically in the first game at all. The other one is that they were still there, but not on board the Contact Light, as in that they were either already on the Roar 1 planet, or they ended up there in some other way. I'm already the topic of the Roar 1 survivors. Developer Hopo stated that the survivors didn't all leave as a group, meaning that there is a canonical ending to the first game, but for now it is unknown. The Predator Instinct log in Risk of Rain 2 states that A demon fallen from the sky Mighty enough to slay Providence and his worms. Only two arms, two legs, but with twenty-two unblinking crimson eyes. Here's a job for you. What is two arms, two legs, and twenty-two unblinking eyes? An imp overlord, of course. However, curb your enthusiasm. The log for your Providence and Risk of Rain 1 states that the I person killed him as it is written in the first person view, unless the author is an imp overlord that forgot about its own species, but that seems highly unlikely to me. As for the 22 unblinking crimson eyes, it might be a way to poke fun at the common imagery of stacking lens makers glasses, 
as it seems you put on multiple glasses to increase your critical hit chance. Fun fact, actually. If those are Risk of Rain 1 Lensmaker's glasses, then the killer had 11 pairs, which is equal to 77% crit chance, as they stack by 7% in that game. But if they are the Risk of Rain 2 version, then they have 110% crit chance as it stacks by 10%. A bit overkill, I would say. One of the more common comments I get is of content that's in the game files but isn't playable. The comment from developer Hopo states that data mine content is not indicative of future content. Typically it wasn't completed for a reason. Something being in the files may stay in the files and never see the light of day. Until it is released we cannot treat its existence as genuine. For example, claimen might be in the game files but they are not seen or mentioned in Risk of Rain 2 as of now. We know they exist in Risk of Rain 1, but we don't know if they're still around. It's not akin to the enemy children, who are not in the game as an enemy, but are still mentioned in the parent log. Now let's move on to the second part of this video, the more frequently asked questions, asked by you, the viewer. Providence is a very mysterious entity that we still don't know too much about. What we do know, however, is that he is incredibly powerful and bears the title of a bulwark of the week. He crashed the US contact light and had a duel to the death with the Risk of Rain 1 survivor, in which they lost. Being the final boss and shrouded in ambiguity, he is very much discussed in the lore community. What is his motivation, and why did he crash the contact light? In the Brittle Crown log, an entity discusses someone who has taken doomed species to their planet, assumedly to shelter them. Someone who protects the doomed, the weak, bulwark of the weak. It's very widely accepted that this entity speaks of providence. This means the creatures seen on the planet likely aren't native and has someone been brought to the planet. However, they later describe his actions as selfish. They state that providence doesn't want to protect, but enslave and imprison. He doesn't let them leave, make constructs of war and rises great walls, despite being a protector. This has led to a lot of discussion on the nature of Providence. Is he a hypocrite? Or is he maybe a naive and powerful creator who thinks he knows better? What if he is a demented collector of the less fortunate? Please do take into consideration that the Brittle Crown narrator is rather biased. The relative of Providence seems to be trapped on a dead rock and is not very happy with all Provi's actions being more of a Darwinist and lacking symphony for a doomed species. We got some more information in the artifacts update, getting us the logs of a moment fractured and the bulwark's ambry. Here we get to see once again the narrator mentioning their brother but in a far different tone. They mention building a gate that can cross the dark sea, presumably space, instantly without succumbing to its sickness. They seem to have invented a way to teleport using gates. The relative is thrilled of the thought of seeing more of their kind, wanting a certain she to take many gates with her next time she shows around. Interestingly enough, a she is also mentioned in the Brittle Crown log, wasting her powers on Providence according to the narrator. Speaking of which, Providence doesn't share the relative's enthusiasm, still thinking about the weak and how they must be sheltered. The weak, who the relative spares no thoughts to. Providence offers the relative to go through the gate first and the story ends there. Seeing as the relative later states that they are trapped on a dead rock, it has led many to believe Pravi didn't go through with the relative and sailed off the gate, leaving the planet his to rule. This is the most popular theory, but still just speculation nonetheless. The gates could also explain how Providence got the doomed species over to their planet. It is mentioned that the gate is a team effort of Pravi's construction and the relative's design something elaborated more in the Bulwark's Ambre log, where the relative states that they love design and have found the compounds of the universe. But it is Providence who has to create something out of it. The relative can design, but Providence is the one who creates. This also shows us that whatever species Providence and the relative is, they carry immense and almost godlike powers. Yet they can still be slain by a human with 200 crowbars. Who is the relative, however? There are actually two competing theories trying to elaborate on that. Such a lust for revenge! Ooh! The first one is that the relative Providence is the He mentioned in the shaped glass and Hellfire Tincture log. The He has been dubbed Providence by the community. It's as internet as a name can be, but it still conveys the theory well. The shaped glass log states that it is of a god's design. 
a god who designs. Sounds like the relative. Insecurities from the fairies stem from the way it's written. Is the he mentioned the relative that designed the glass? Or simply just someone else utilizing the design of the relative? The log seems to detail the creation of the shaped glass. So is Providence also here? Still, it's a very relevant theory in the community and important to be aware of as it is the most dominant one. Oh! The second theory is the one of the heretic Kurskan. Among the lunar items there are two related to heresy. The strides of heresy and the visions of heresy. The detailed evisceration of the heretic. How she was split into four pieces and scattered across the moon, seemingly for her wrongdoings. But my dear viewer, what is a moon but a dead rock? Who else was trapped on a dead rock again? This has led many to believe the heretic is the relative of Providence, a sister, but I assume Sisvidence never caught on. This fear includes a lot of questions as to what she did to get so brutally torn to pieces, and who did it? It does however explain why the relative sounds so bitter in the brittle crown log. So that's two things going for it, the location and the motive. I personally believe that both theories have a lot going for them, and I'm not here to try to take any sides, I'm just presenting it to you, so you can make your own decisions and observations. On a slightly related note, when asked if Providence would return in Risk of Rain 2, the dev simply replied, he did. Therefore, the shadow that is seen at the end of the Risk of Rain 2 console trailer is probably not just Providence. The floating shards forming a halo of sorts seem to be indicative of Providence and might also be the trademark of whatever the species Providence and their relative is. The shadow might be from said relative, or for all we know, Hopo could pull a Kirby and give us Providence soul. Moving on to our final topic of today, Mequana. A representative of the balance between life and death, a she that would comfort them when they died. Same she as the brittle crown log? Who knows. It's a very heated topic, but ultimately the only thing that ties them together is the pronoun and the fact they have immense power, which is not too much to go by. The basis of Nakuhana's concepts is that you need both life and death to equalize one another. Or how can one live if they can't die? A cult has arised worshipping here ideas, killing in the name of Nakuhana to bring balance as there is too much life in the universe. We can see an example of this with one of her followers in the Sacrificial Dagger, Wetlands Aspect and Nekuhana's Opinion Logs. The logs detail how the follower, pre-conversion, had to kill a survivor named Marion with a knife in order to fend up some golems. This had a noticeable effect on said survivor. Another person, Paul, who witnessed the killing of Marion was quite disturbed. A knife wielder took the decision to silence Paul, permanently. The rest of the survivors made camp and found a book which according to our narrator made everything make sense. It's assumed that this is the book of Nakohana's concept, most likely the Netormat. Later the narrator kills everyone, following the concepts most likely. Something worth noting is that a person named Carney got killed and his corpse got hidden in a cave underneath. Sure enough, wander there yourself and you can find a twitching skeleton holding his head. Note the horns. Similar horns are what Nukahana's opinion displays. The log for that item details a cultist's ritual in which they explain her concepts. The log is an excerpt from the Natormat, the scriptures of Nakuhana, more specifically the second verse in the first stanza, chapter 1. People have coined the narrator of the dagger and wetlands aspect logs as Vashan, who just like giving names I suppose. I personally believe Vashan is the phrase they say after gospel akin to Christianity's Amen. I think so because of how it's used in a Kohana's opinion log. It has an exclamation mark at the end of it, and it's already signed as being quoted by the Netormat. It doesn't make sense to me to sign off your name with an exclamation mark. Also, if we are to believe the narrator found the Netormat, and that is the thing that quote-unquote made everything make sense, then his name being in said book would be very confusing. I understand how the misconception could have arised from how the Shan is written at the end of Atlant's aspect log, but I frankly and personally believe that it isn't meant to be deciphered as a name. If you kill a Malachite elite, then you have a chance to get their elite aspect, Nakohana's retort. The effect of the Malachite is a retort to the increase of life on this planet. 
by simply disabling all healing for a moment, death increases. It's a neat correlation that makes a lot of sense. In the real world, a malachite is a copper hydroxide material with the same characteristic color. In the past it was used to ward off evil spirits on influences of the same kind. As for why life and death suddenly got out of balance? Well, it might have to do something with providence stopping doomed species from going extinct. That would logically reduce the amount of deaths in the universe. Alright, I think that's it. I know I didn't answer all the questions, but I think these are the most pressing ones. Oh, what's this now? Are there fish on this planet? Are there fish on this planet? There are squids. Hermit crabs and those weird oysters. Does that count? Welcome, glad you made it to the end. I once again want to give a special thanks to Tilted Hat for helping me understand how the community views some certain aspects of the lore. I also want to clarify that when the lore is fully developed, or at least more developed, I will do more detailed and ambient videos going over the topics in their entirety. This video is um, more of an attempt to make the topics approachable so more people like you can join in on the discussion. I sincerely hope it worked, I hope you enjoyed it, thank you so very much for watching and have a cozy evening. Will quickly become outdated. You're doing f***ing construction work right now? <laughs>